I'm your father. Uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about, I realize that there is, there are many ways to skin a cat, there are many ways to do things. Some people would never want to do a segmented bull in their life, and that's fine. Uh, other people might want to try, and that's fine too. Um, I find just as much beauty in a solid piece as I do some of my fake, uh, my segmented pieces. On this shelf over there, I see pieces that I really love that are a segmented. And I do both. You know, I switch it. Number one, I tell my wife that uh, I do my segmented for here, and I do the other pieces for here. Because I, I can sell the other pieces at a, at a price that people afford. Once in a while, somebody will come along and they really appreciate the segmented pieces, and they give me three, four hundred dollars for it. But it's a lot easier to sell something like that for maybe what, 150? Yeah. Uh, it'll go first, I guarantee you. Every year I bring back from Florida an Orford pine, and I try to make some big, big bowls. Why? Because that's for here. I really don't like to make them. Oh, they're kind of fun. But I'd really rather be doing some things for here. So you think you get, you get a better money from one of these than the segmented? No. Oh. I'm more apt to, I get less money, but I'm more apt to sell it. Oh, okay. that's good. Well, and you know, really, at my age, I don't... I, I, something I remember Mark told me one day. I said, I'm really feeling a lot of pressure about getting ready for a while. And he says, hey, he says, are you going to starve to death if you don't do this? <laughs> And I said, well, I guess not. Uh, so I don't know why, why do I worry about selling so much? I don't know. It's nice because I can take that money and buy me a new bandsaw or actually in a new shop for several years. So for that, I like it. But as far as is mom and I going to eat, you know, we're going to eat regardless. <laughs> All right, I started at the, I told you I'm kind of backward. Well, I started at the top. Now we're going to start at the bottom. <laughs> and eventually we're going to get to how to cut rings. And I want to leave about 20 minutes for that, so if I get too tangled up here, would you stop me? Okay, all this is, well, let me take it out and check. Okay. Uh, when I started this project, I made three waste blocks like this. Because I was going to make three bolts. You saw one. There's another one sitting over there yet. Or sitting here. Okay, and I started them all on the same kind of like waste block. Just cut a tenon on a three-quarter inch piece of pretty good strong wood and then flatten this and glue my, then I can glue my first ring on there and I have something to hold on to this end of it. I showed you how to hold on to the other end when you do the back. So now I've got something to hold on to it while I'm working. This always isn't perfect. Several years ago, uh, uh, Roy brought me a piece of, of a boat arc. It's cut into a board. It had all kinds of splits in it. And for a while I was using the boat arc to make these, these waste blocks on it. And lo and behold, guess what happened? The last, that hole that I just did, I did on one of those waste blocks. And the arc button split. And came off the lathe. Didn't cause any damage, but I had to then turn it around and turn a new tenon. And so I like to use something good for a waste block. Okay, so this is on here. We're ready to roll. 
the first thing I want to show you, if I can find it, where did I put my drill? Maybe here. Ah! Is how I'm going to start at the bottom. And I'm going to tell you as I do this, that among sacred meta turners, I'm kind of a, uh, I'm kind of a charlatan when it comes to bottoms. They're going to kick them out. Yes. Yeah, just keep yeah. rolling it. Keep right. rolling back. There. Um, uh, uh, Kurt Peeball. Malcolm Kiggins. And any other number of turners tell me, Mick, don't do this. But I've done it for 10 years and I've had very few bottoms come apart, if any. Usually if they come apart, it's my fault because I fit too tight or too loose. So I'm going to keep doing it this way. And I will, the next time I go and take a bowl and say, Malcolm or Kurt, how am I doing? First thing you'll do is you turn it over and look at the bottom and say, it won't hold together. <clears throat> they say our Kurt Thiebaud was very adamant about use a solid piece of wood for the bottom. Well, I think the solid piece of wood gives you the same problem that I get here. If I have a solid piece of wood, the grain going this way, and then I have the grain going around, I still have more expansion this way than I do this way. I think it's just as apt to come apart. <coughs> We're going to talk more about grain alignment in a few minutes, but I want to get this kind of done. We're starting at the bottom. The first thing I want to do is make a nice even hole that I can put a plug in. I can't draw. 
Uh, basically what you do, use two different size bits, or just turn a, a rabbit in there, make your hole like this, put a thin piece in, and then turn a little buskin and put it in there, and I've done that. But boy, it's, you know, I don't know that I want to spend that much time. You might say, well, it seems like you spend a lot of time. I guess I spend time when I want to spend time. And it's, close enough. You can do that between layers too. Grab it on one part and then one, one layer and then put the pan on it. Mm -hmm. That's going to be in the way. What? I don't think so. You know what, though? I do know this. There's a sharp little deal down here that'll work better. One time during the ship, the demonstration, I'll do it right. Turn the lead off. There's a reason for that, by the way. It's very easy. And if you notice my knuckles, a lot of times I wish I had. So do it right. Turn the lathe off. Okay. I need one other tool. This was also another birthday present. I got the same kit. I had a pair of calipers and I went up to Mark's one time and I had super glue. And on the way home, the super glue kind of tipped over. And the super glue ran down in here and I've never been able to make it work again. <laughs> so we got a nice round hole here now. Now we need to make something to fit it. So if you guys want to, when you do this, if you want to fill with it, um, you know, the slowly one, that's fine. And if it was a very big plug, I think I would too. But I think for this size of a plug, I'm not going to have that much trouble, or at least I have one in the past. That size you don't have a whole lot of movement.
Now, the other thing you have to remember with this type of mount here, you don't want it your plug to be this way. Whoops. <laughs> I, may, I may have been glad I brought another one of these along, but I made that a little paper, remember? Cross your fingers. It's still just a hair big. But, but not much. Let's see how this is working out. There's nothing to, uh, or I know no way of doing this except what I'm doing. Just very slowly kind of working it down until it fits. That one's easy. 
Now, growing the way you know, I told you about my center mark. Yeah. That when I cut it off, there'll be a center mark there. There it is. I don't even think I'm going to have to do this, but I just put it. this is how I push it in. Well, the way. I didn't have to push very hard, did I? Okay, so that's in. Now the next thing I want to do is start shaping this. And I don't know, that thing might spin in there. So I'm going to do the outside and give it just a second or two to kind of hang. hang. It doesn't take tight long, long to, to, before it's tight. Again, now you were asking me about how many pieces do you glue on before you turn? Usually one. Why should I reach gray in there? I don't have to. Okay, that looks right, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, 
Now you'll notice that I've already flattened this side. That was done at home. This side is raw. Let's glue her out. When we glue her out, then we'll take this one and I'll show you how to get this side flat. Okay, okay. That looks like it's going to fit pretty good. Hello. <laughs> you know what? I'm going to take this down a little more. Oh, and the other thing I haven't done yet, I haven't really flattened this completely, but I want to get it a little. I use this for a multitude of things. I put it on the lathe and flatten the rings, but also I put this on the, put the thing on the lathe. And flatten this. What's your paper, Zach? 60. I didn't think you were supposed to use 60 grit. Huh? I didn't think you were supposed to use 60 grit. Why? Find one working tool. Only if 100 won't work. <laughs> <laughs> Only a 36 won't work. Pretty good. <laughs> That's the wrong thing, guys. My 36 works pretty good. <laughs> That's too big. Case of the missing ring. Is there any, are there any rings anywhere? Anybody have a ring? We have I think this little sucker right here should be it, but it doesn't look like it's going to fit. The one that was yeah. around was the thing Okay, I'm not even going to give that one a dignity glue. What I would do is put it on there, put the glue on, crank it up when it's set for 20 minutes, and then I'd be ready to turn it. We're not going to do that. Since evidently I left the ring home. There's one missing one. So, let's say that the ring is on there and that I've added a couple more rings. Look at there, I got one on glue. Magically. And you'll notice the inside up to that ring is finished. It's not sanded, but it's, it's, it's where I want it. Now this one I may have trouble with. This may be one of the off-center ones. Just a little. Oh, a little. I think we're going to chance it. Not that much. Ten minutes, okay. Ooh, ten minutes. <laughs> Let's go to something else. Okay, what I would have done was shake this this way, this way, flatten it, and I'd be ready for the next ring. You shake it from the outside curve to the inside curve. Usually, I guess the outside curve. Because I, I need to kind of, I know how, where that outside needs to be, and then I work the inside to it. Okay, what we haven't talked about is how to cut segments. And he says, I got 20 minutes, so I guess 20 minutes we'll use. <laughs> 20 segments. The old people got bad memories. <laughs> okay. This is a eight sided sled. I've made it many different ways. I used to make this out of one inch wood, and I was always cutting them in two. So I finally found that nice piece of wood and planked it down and I made it out of that. There are two things that are important with a segment. They all have to be exactly the same length. This takes care of that. Can you all see that? Okay, I just set this 
If I need a two inch segment, I set that to two inches. Clamp it down. I cut the first end, turn it over, put it in there, cut again, and then turn it, cut again, just keep turning back and forth. Any questions about that? That takes care of the length. What's the other thing that has to be the same? The angle. This is where I spend a lot of my time. Can you all see this little deal right here? Can you see it better here? There. Okay. This little block here. This arm is on a pivot. Okay, there's a little block and there's a little, can you see that little wedge? Okay, and right here there's a screw. The screw holds this arm tight against this block. So what I do, I cut a ring and I look at it and see how well it fits. And depending on how well it fits, I then move that little wedge back and forth, just a little, until it fits. Okay, this ring, I cut on that sled last night. I haven't sanded, I haven't done anything since it came off of the saw. Okay, here's just an extra segment I cut. You can look at it and see how uh, the smoothness. But that's how my, this thing's working right now. When I came here, when I came back, it had been sitting all year. It had fallen on the floor once. This is how it was cutting. It had bad, you know, it, it just wasn't fitting together. So what I chose to do with this one, I, I use these little nails, and I glue four segments and four segments. They're getting tight now. And my goodness, this last joint is going to be terrible. See? How can I fix that? Well, I got a 12 inch sander that looks kind of like that with a table that's nice and square. You just take that ring and on the sander and it'll fit. But I don't like to do that. The reason I don't like to do that is because this is, after you do that, this is no longer a circle. It's now an oval. For some things it's okay and for some things it isn't. Okay. I use two, two sides, or two sizes, I use usually eight or 16. This is off of my 16 side of jig right off the saw. And that's one that I used when I was really zeroing in my, my, my sled. But this little thing right back here is the important thing, this little wedge. Any questions about that? How do you how do you first determine between two and a half? How do you do like a tractor that you're using or is that really good? You can use a dime protractor. You can actually get it right off of here, just cut a piece of paper. And lay it on. I've got a fifty dollar dial protractor at home. I don't need it. Because I'm only going to get it approximate even with that. After that when you put the ring together, it's either going to be open here or here. If you put the ring and it's open here, what's wrong? If it's open in the center, your angle's too great. So you back off on your angle. If it's open up here, your angle's too small. So you make the angle a little tiny bit bigger. Andy Chen has a neat way of doing this. He gets it down and he'll finally use layers of masking tape until he gets it just where he wants to be. And I've used layers of masking tape too, but I really like this little deal here. It's, I think, quicker. 
how do you loosen this and, and then tighten it again after you put the Actually, there are no screws in there holding that now. All those holes are empty. The only screw holding it is this one back here. Which is holding this way. It's holding this. Oh, it's going all through there. All through there. That screws that long. Okay. It goes through the wedge. Uh huh. I wish I could take it apart. The wedge is shaped, uh, it's got a slot. It's, it's just a real thin wedge, and it's got a slot that fits right over that screw. And that way I can slide it back and forth. There are a million ways to do this. Are there any questions about this? Uh, Rockler and Necro makes a jig like that too. You can spend a lot of money on jigs. Yeah. But I still say it's so, so easy to make. If you really want to make a jig and you want the exact dimensions to do this, he talks about the sines and cosines and everything, but in the end he gets, comes down to the exact, exact measurements. Uh, go to Kevin Neely's website and look under tools, his, uh, his jigs that he's made. Do I have another minute? Yes. So are there any questions about cutting angles? Yes. Can you sand this angle at all? Hopefully not. Okay. The only time I do is if it doesn't fit. Okay. But hopefully it's going to fit. Now, out of all those rings I made for these three pieces, and I'm going to finish all those three pieces, I had to sand two joints. And why that was, it was probably human error in when I put it in the sled. A lot of times if I see an opening, I'll go and look and I'll see a bad joint and I'll just take that one out and throw it and go cut another one. But usually they fit, they fit like the one I'm passing around. Uh, again, Kirk Thiebaud says you have to sand joints. <coughs> and I've got a little attachment I can put on my 12-inch on my, uh, uh, sander with a little arm just like that, and I can take it and slide it in there and sand that joint. But I don't like to use it. I think I get as good a joint this way as I do if I sand. I prefer not to sand it, it's a pain. Yeah, it's a pain and you're doing what, when I see people sanding, I say you're doing what you should have done when you set your saw up. If you're going to do this, spend a good day with your table saw. The blade needs to be straight with the table. It needs not to be tracking like this. It needs to be tracking straight. And if you get those things set up right, you'll make a good cut. You know, if you see these little on the back, that's because your saw blade's running through crooked. And my saw blade right now is running a tiny bit crooked. It needs a little adjustment, but it's still cutting. I use a stiffener, too. I use a stiffener. I use a, a uh, forest, mm -hmm. yeah. forest river? Uh, just forest. Okay, a forest, uh, and it's... Woodworker uh, 2, I think, is what I yeah. use. It's a two big washers this big that are machined, and I put those on the blade to keep and that keeps this down. Um, I use a thick blade rather than a thin blade for the same reason. Thin blade will give you just a little of this. Any other questions? Oh, can I talk about one more thing? Sure. You got 20 minutes. I got 20 minutes. I got 20 minutes before. The one board that was here. Uh, yeah. <coughs> uh, this is something that good segmented turners wouldn't do. When they make a piece, they want all of the grain to be a line going the same direction. Why? Because of expansion contraction. For the same reason, yeah. That they don't want me to use a plug. Uh, 
every time you put grain conflicting, like the grain here conflicts with this grain. These two really conflict. These two are pretty close. Wood expands more in this direction here than it does this way. So what I'm doing, I'm setting up by not matching those grains, internal stresses in the wood. And I'm apt to be, this might be sitting on the fireplace next week, and I might hear a crack, and this may separate. I don't think it will, because I've made this pattern before and none of them have. Any questions about that? So, you, want, you don't want conflict in your grain. You want to try to make all of your grain go the same direction. And this one, the conflict is right here and here. Hopefully it holds. This one. There's one tiny bit of conflict in it, but not much. Because you can see the grain going this way, while the grain on the white, even though you can't see it much, is going the same direction. Can anybody tell me where the conflict is? Your, uh, it's in your border. Your border, your block that you put in between okay. the liners. Okay, it's fine here, but here it's in conflict. But even Bert Thiebaud says, an eighth of an inch you can get by with. So I hope I get by with it. You know the, the square one I do with the square corners? Yeah. I mark Malcolm uh, Tibbetts and Kirk critiqued that the last time I went to the show. And the one thing they said, those two pieces of zebra wood that go this way were in conflict. And then it might came apart. Well, I made 10 of them over a year. Of course, a year isn't very long, is it? Maybe someday it will. Uh, sometimes I really like to watch grain alignment, but I also like my, I like my design to look right. And that's always in conflict. Are there any questions you guys got? What have I forgotten? Do we have time to flatten this real quick? Kind of what? Flatten it. Sure. Ten minutes? <laughs> there, oh, there you go. I mean, and while I'm doing this, the other thing I want to mention, and I talked to Charles, I didn't talk to you about this. He said it's fine. I wouldn't mind at all having a few people over, like maybe one night for a while or one afternoon. The thing I don't want, and I, I, I want to be very careful about, I don't like a divided club. And I wouldn't want segmented turners and solid turners not to be speaking to each other or not be going to each other meetings. But if we could come and you're real interested in doing segmented turning, this will be done. <laughs> I'm almost glad I didn't have time to do this. <laughs> Anybody see my glasses? I should at least wear them. It's always a day. 
Yeah. Well, we keep going down. Yeah.
expert in eye protection. My uh, ophthalmologist gave me a big lecture. So I am trying to get better. My big problem today was that I'm trying to condense like three days work into two hours or maybe a week's work. Um, so what I did, I have three pieces started in different, in different stages. stages. Thank you. Um, and I'm going to be real dumb. I'm going to start with doing probably one of the last stages because <laughs> glue has to dry. This is um, a piece that this 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 is going to be the bowl that that we're going to going to make. Okay, this is going to be the top of the bowl. I will never get in here again um, to do any finishing. So I've kind of finished the inside of the bowl and the inside of the top. The next thing, I'll just kind of fit it on there. And I'm going to glue this. And while that's setting, we'll talk about something else. The only thing I ever use, type on original formula. I've tried other glues. I've tried the other type bonds and every one of them squishes. When it dries, it squishes out and I can feel the glue joints. I can't feel that with type bond two or uh, type bond original. And it always seemed to hold what I did. So right now I'm gonna get this thing glued on here, then we'll let it sit for a while, and then after it sits and sets, then we can turn the top. Nick, I'm sorry, I was being obnoxious and kicked over my coffee when you were saying that. Did you, which kind of glue you said works the best? Type bond original formula. Okay. So the very first type bond they ever made. Okay. The, there are some waterproof ones now, and yeah. other ones. This it, it just seems to work. What, what you call them, squishy? That's that's blue cream. Yeah. Well, it doesn't do that. No, no. I I've noticed something else though. As I've gotten better at making my joints, I've had less glue creep. I thought usually younger, newer stuff was always better than older stuff. Is that not? <laughs> Uh, my <laughs> my father-in-law was an old Scotchman, and he had a he had a saying, and the saying went something like this: huh, "New and improved, be suspicious of it." What are you going to do when they quit making that kind? Well, I'll worry about that when they quit making it. By the way, you might want to know how I turned this. Okay. I started out with just a piece like this. Okay, I glued this layer on, and then I turned a tenon, and then I stuck it in the layer this way, and I turned the inside of it. You always got to think now, how am I going to get the other side done? We'll talk more about that because I'm actually going to turn this one. What do you, what do you cut your joint with? Uh, we'll get into that. A table saw. A table saw. And not a great table saw, but a pretty good one. What kind of blade on I use a 62 carbide and not a narrow one, not a thin cut. I find with a thin cut, it, I get too much of this. And I'm very particular about who sharpens my blade and who sets it. I've only got one person in this area that I'll leave them allowed to touch my blade. Where's that? Um, the guy in Rogers. American Sharpening. American, I was going to say U.S. Sharpening, but it's American Sharpening. 
Uh, he's a good. He's a good sharpener. You know where that is. It's, you know it's where on the Modern Activity Center is. A Street and Second. It's yeah. It's Olive Street and Second, excuse me. Olive Street and Second, yeah. Um, it's across from the skate park, across he, Olive Street. He skate actually park. Oh, skate park is. sharpens plates with a CNC machine. <laughs> That's made just for sharpening blades. <laughs> I don't know if I can talk to get this glue on here or not. I want to use glue, but I don't want to use so much of it. it squishes inside it because then I gotta figure out how I'm gonna clean that up. Of course, nobody but me can it is gonna know it's there, but if I know, now we can. You know too now, won't you? <laughs> Lick it off. Well, one thing I didn't bring today was a paper towel. <laughs> Hey, thank you. Uh, I'm not going to be in a hurry to do this. I mean, that glue's not going to set up that quick. And with this joint, I usually slop the glue on and let it squish and worry about that later, but I can't on this case, but I like to coat both sides. Why, I don't know. I have a big blue bottle at home and I didn't bring it. I hope there's enough in here to do this. Yeah, let's put it on the old finger here. Best loose, brother. Ah! Since I have paper towels now, I can do this. My wife says that I'm the messiest person. She won't let me in her kitchen. <laughs> now you can see why. She said the last time I got in the kitchen there was spaghetti sauce on the ceiling. <laughs> I tried it in neat. I think I should have brought my other glue thing. We may not do much gluing today. What is that noise? You're breathing? Breathing in the mic. I'm going to stop that. That's great. Hey, just, move, just move this down a little bit. Uh, he may throw it at me if I give it to him. If That's you want great. to, if you need it, you can, you can try that. Um, <laughs> I've got enough. Okay. We're going to put this together and then we can let it set and then we can talk about some things while this is drying. How? Well, I don't know. Weather. Okay, I want to get this. I should have told you. Well, I'll tell you this while we're talking. I'm just going to use this. Well, it's not looking very centered. That looks pretty good. That doesn't for some reason. I'll tell you what happened. I got a confession to make. I did something stupid. Did you ever do anything stupid? I seem to be able to do that quite frequently. I got ready to start this project and I remembered, like, it's your fault. <laughs> the last time I was sitting here with my, with my branch, Jim said, well, if you clean that with lacquer thinner and oil it up, it'd work better. So I said, well, I'm not going to go back there and embarrass myself again. So I took my chuck all apart and laid all of the pieces out, soaked them in lacquer thinner, oiled them up, got them good and clean, put them back together. I don't know if you've ever put the, the dogs back in the chuck. But they're numbered, one, two, three, four, and there's a number stamped on the chuck, one, and you go, turn the thing in, you go, one, two, three, four. 
Well, evidently, I went one, <coughs> three, two, something. Anyhow, my, I didn't realize it, but my chuck was turning off center. So everything I did for this demonstration, or a lot of it, was turned off center. Uh, Arthur was watching me when I was trying to center this thing up. Um, it had a, like a quarter inch of wobble in it. I use my lathe for a, a, for a, a clamp. Uh, I was told one time that um, it's not good for the lathe to use it for a clamp. Well, I'll tell you one thing, if I put a piece of wood in there like that, I'm going to put it down a lot tighter than that, I know that. And what is it? It's a clamp. <clears throat> hey, do, you, do you look at your joints when you're gluing that up? Yes, sir. And all I tried to do in this one, I, I didn't really, in this, because this top, this piece here, the top piece, oh, it's segmented, yes, and I did look at it. And if you'll look, that joint lines up with every other one. And, oh, yes. See here? Skip one. No, skip one. Okay. Well, I four, so skip just a little bit. And since you brought that out. Just rotate it uh, just towards the camera. Just rotate the piece a little bit. Well, it's clamped in the receiver. It's not going to rotate real well right now. Uh, maybe it will. Can you see the joints? Yeah. There's one here. Got that one. There's and it's one. lined up with this one down here, and it's skipped. It's like a bricklayer's job, and I'll tell you why. And that's good because that'll give us something to talk about while we're. Do we have any markers? Uh, we do. We do. I can mark the screen. I think this. Don't write on this one. I can't get it up. Oh. Uh, well, I'll just have to do the best I can. Uh, there are three kinds of wood joints. And let me tell you about the one that I use. The one I use is end grain to end grain. Of the three kinds of joints that I can do, end grain to end grain is what? Weakest. The weakest one. Okay, the other thing I can do is end grain to size, and that is a little bit stronger, but not too good. Which way is the best? That. Okay. Well, I got no choice here. It's going to have to be end grain. A lot of times, if I drop these on the floor, they'll pop. So. After they put together, I put them together, they don't pop because they go together like this. I would feel very uncomfortable, and I have done that a couple of times for design's sake, to put it together this way. Again, because you've got that big end grain joint all the way down the bowl and it's half crack. You do it this way, it's just like a brick layer. You don't see bricks coming apart unless you're got Roman bricks. All right. I actually made a work. This is something that some of them do. I actually made a working drawing of this bowl I'm making, and you can tell me how close it came. Um, but I'll take one of these, okay, I'll take one of these and do a little explanation here. I didn't want to make too big of a bowl, uh, because I'm cheap, it did take a lot of lumber because making three of these, but I'll get rid of them. 
Okay, this is the first sheet we want to look at. The one with kind of the picture of half a bowl. The last person I showed this to, he said, well, you only made half of a bowl. And well, the other one, besides the thing was this one. Okay, now I'll try to leave that alone. So, in drawing this bowl, or, or this piece, I think the first thing I did was make three quarter inch lines here. Well, got to turn this. 90 degrees, there we go. Okay. So the first thing I did, well the first thing I did was folded the piece of paper in half because I needed the center line. Then I drew these lines in, and I think they're about three quarters of an inch. Okay, and then I started sketching my bowl. And basically, I just sketched the outside of the bowl. You can see it's kind of rough and I'm kind of shaky anymore. And then I tried to put the inside in, and I tried to keep it about a quarter of an inch. Because that's pretty good, a pretty good I have a question. Is that where it says inch and a half? Is that the length of the segment across the, the we'll, back end of it? We'll get to that in just a minute. Okay. Okay. When you say when you just said you try to keep it a quarter inch, what wall thickness? The thickness. The wall thickness of the piece. <laughs> okay, and that's I don't know. It might be a little more, a little less. Okay, the next thing I do, I have to figure out, I have to figure out how wide to make each one of these segments. Because as you can see here, for this part of the bowl up here, if I made a three quarter inch segment, I'd never make it from here to here because the slope is going to be very flat here. So I need a big wide segment. Okay. Coming up the side, probably right here, I, if I was real good, I could have got by with a quarter inch piece. Oh, I'm not that good. So the next thing I do then is draw these. And as you notice, I give myself a little bit of play because... You're not perfect. Well, what if I get one of these things a little bit off center? That's Jim's fault for having you. Yeah, it. it's your... <laughs> okay, anyhow, so I draw these lines in here. Okay. Brought my... Well, I can't measure with that. I brought my trusty ruler. So then, this is a glasses job. Okay, then I can go by and, me and measure these. Okay, that one was about an inch and a quarter, inch and a half. It's actually an inch and a quarter. Can you see that okay? Okay, you come up to here, well, those run about seven-eighths of an inch. It's a little more, a little less. Look up here. Okay, this one is like five-eighths of an inch. But look at this one. Okay, that one I'm going to have to pay attention to, aren't I? Well, I came to a happy medium here. Who wants to sit there and, and do an eighth of an inch and move the red fence and have a lot of waste? So I just decided, well, an inch will cover everything. So I tried to make my segments about an inch, maybe a little less. That covers everything from here to here and here. So I had one, you know, I could rip one board. I didn't have to rip six boards, and I, I can waste a little longer. 
any other thing that's a little bigger. Now, if I get something a little bit off center, I've got some room to play. Okay, you were asking about these measurements over here, Doug. Yeah. We're going to get to that now if I can find my good pointer here again. So each, okay, so this, this was the width of the width that I use. This way. Okay. The next thing I need to know is either the radius of the diameter of my piece. So then I took my ruler and I set it down here like this. And I said, that's about two and an eighth. So, the radius of that ring has to be two and an eighth inch. And it needs to be two and an eighth inch to the flat place, not the point, if you want to keep your directions correct. I'll show you how to do that in a minute. So, each one of these dimensions here is the radius of that particular of that particular piece, like this one, two and an eighth. Now that's to the outside edge you're measuring. To the out, from the center line to the outside edge, because that's what, if I turn to the inside edge, then my bolt's going to be a quarter inch smaller, which I guess isn't a great sin. So I just keep going like that, and I mark all of these diameters off, or these radii off. Okay, that one was, hmm, I've got two and five eighths. That looks like more like two and a quarter, doesn't it? Well, you didn't go to the outside edge of the piece. Oh, excuse me, that's what it is. Thank you, Jim. You come in handy. <laughs> so, two and five eighths. Can you see that? Okay, so now I got all these. What am I going to do with them? I still don't know how big to cut my ring pieces. Turn to the next page. Does somebody have one? Is there an extra one? No, we're trying to figure out. I think something happened. Everybody only got one page, I think. Oh, did you all not have this page? Yeah, no. Okay. Okay, you have this page too? Two pages. Uh, I'm going to apologize for my drawings. They're not, they're not the greatest. They're working drawings. And guess what? Probably in the last hundred bowls I've made, I've actually drawn two. I usually don't go through this step. I usually start and think of a shape, and I say, well, the bottom's going to be about that big around and make a ring. And then I build them out, and I build them in, and I say, well, this is going to have to be a little bigger. And it usually works. I need one piece for a fold. You can have another one. Okay, the neat thing here, I'm doing eight-sided pieces. Okay, to do an eight-sided piece, I need to get eight sides. Okay, how many sides do I have now? Four. So if I do that one more time, and you can be as neat as you want about this, we're making a computer here. That's all this is. As a matter of fact, you can buy a hundred dollar or Computer program will do the same thing. All right. I've got eight sides, and this computer tells me a lot of things. If I can never get a report. We're not going to look at the front. But. Okay. There's my eight, my eight segments. Okay. So 
put this down on the table, darken these lines in so you can see them good. And what do you have? You have this little sucker right here. I like my pointer. I brought a pencil for this, but somewhere I missed it. Well, it is there. Let's try it. Okay. So, I now take my compass. And I go back to the first sheet. And I start with ring number one. It's also important to label your, your rings so you know where you are. So I start with number one. Well, it was one and a half inches. This is number one. So I put my compass point here and I strike an arc. One and a half inches. Okay. Now remember we said we wanted the segment the diameter to be to this point here. We didn't want it here because it would be littler. So then you just lay your ruler down. Or you, am I blocking this too much or are you seeing it? No, and you draw, what is that? It's a tangent, isn't it? Okay. Then to get the size of the ring, you just measure that tangent. Looks like that one needs to be about an inch and three quarters. This is for an eight-sided bowl, by the way. So then you go to ring number two, number three, number four, number five. And by the way, if you run out of squares, you could just keep going and go back around again. You could draw them all in for each one, but this one for, for number one, this one's going to be just like this one. So just draw one segment in, and you can go around for 15 segments on this piece of paper. So now we know how long each segment should be. Um, this you need to do pretty carefully. You can get a lot of more things from the computer if you want it. Okay, we know the radius. And we know that that will be the length of the segment, the tangent of that line. We also, if we wanted to, look here. What's that right there? Radius. This. Angle. That's angle. I have to cut my my piece. There's a formula for this, and the formula is right up here. Um, the angle is equal to 360 divided by the number of sides times 2. Eight sides. You do the math for me because I'm not much of a, even though I don't use sines and cosines and all that stuff. I knew that one time, but I've gotten older and I forgot it all, so I don't do that anymore. Um, I like simple arithmetic. Okay, 360 divided by 8 is what? 45. 45, 45 divided by 2? 22 and a half degrees. We know now the angle that we have to cut each one of these pieces at if we're going to make an eight-sided figure. If you want to make other sides, it's very easy to plug the number of sides into this far, uh, formula and get the answer. Let's say 10 sides. Ten in, uh, this one I can do in my head. 10 into 360 is yeah. what? 36. Well, it comes out 18 degrees. Mm -hmm. um, 16 sides. It's just going to be half of what we have here, 11 and a quarter. But you can put it into the 16, into this formula, and it'll work out for you. Any questions so far? I'm eyeing this thing up. Okay, we're going to, as I say, this is going to be awfully broken up today. Are you going to do about a three-week class on this at any time?
Uh, she lost me about an hour. I lost you? No. Well, well tell me where you lost. No, no, it's, not, it's just my, when you start getting into all the 16th and stuff, it's simple arithmetic. That's where you lost me. I'm a stockbroker. I don't do math. I know stockbrokers. <laughs> My stockbroker can do math. He probably takes your money. Sometimes. <laughs> and sometimes she says, well, I guess I. But it's usually not a man. Nick, I've seen in some places you know, that there are some computer programs. That's what I say, there are. <coughs> I mean, I know you don't use them, but for somebody that is learning, is that better or to try to force yourself to learn what you've learned better? Well, I want to tell you something. I, if you do it the way Nick does it, that's the simplest way and the quickest way there is to do it. Okay. And the computer program, well, well, the thing, the computer program, the reason I don't like computer program backgrounds, I kind of like to know why I'm doing what I'm doing. The computer does all of this for you. You still had to do all the drawing. It'll spit out the length of each segment for you at the end, tell you how wide to cut them. But why do I do that? And what if I get in the middle of the project and I decide, hmm, this isn't looking right. I want to do it a little different. How can I correct it? I guess you can go back and ask the computer. But if you understand what you're doing, yes, then I can go back and correct that. Anyhow, these are, as I say, personal preferences. Other people use the computer program, that's fine. Nick, the thickness and the width of all the pieces that go into the layer are the same, are the same, right? In other words, the thickness and well, the width. No, they're actually not. Yeah, I mean, on each layer, are Okay, most, in this case, in this case, most of them were because this slope was pretty consistent. But when I got up to here... No, he's talking about the thickness, man. Oh, excuse me. The thickness of each material going to each layer, and the width of the material going to each layer. Usually, well, I'm going to say usually. Usually it's the same. Uh-huh. Sometimes it, it works when I start doing pattern pieces that I may need a one this thick. It, it depends on the design, right? Yeah. Well, like when I do the moons, you've all seen the moons. I take the board. If this was a three-quarter inch board, it ain't. But if it was, I'll set it up and cut my angles this way because I need a big place to put that moon in. It still fits in the fold. I imagine it's three quarters of an inch thick and just standing it up this way and cutting your segment. Did you run those rings to a sander before you come to go? I'll show you. I think the way it's asking is though, but for each, each segmented yeah. ring, you use just a board that's the same thing as in width. That's why I say in general, general, yes. Yeah, for each, each layer, less all, I need. all the layers may vary. No, and usually they're all, uh, this width here is all the same, unless my pattern calls for a bigger piece. I may want a, a segment that is tall if I'm putting a design in it. Sure. Then the second question was, is do you sand the rings to take the rings out? Yeah. The only, okay, I, when I'm putting my rings together, and I'm going to glue one for you here in a minute, I don't worry about that. Okay, what I do worry about is when I finally get a ring made. I'm going to pass these around. One side is sanded. Okay. The only side that I'm worried about being sanded is the one that's going to go against the next ring. Oh, and then you take it out on the... I'll show you how to take that out after a while. Okay. You know what? Any other questions about what we've gone through so far? 
You might tell them you use a drum sander for it, not just a... Uh, uh, I use two things. To flatten those rings. You do? You use ones? I have a drum sander, and I can lay those rings on the belt, and they just whew, all one after another through. But sometimes they get a tiny bit of snipe, and I'm going to demonstrate this in a minute. This is my favorite tool for flattening rings. It's also my unfavorite tool for skinning my knuckles and the ends of my fingers. <laughs> one slip, and we're going to do one in a minute. At home when I do this, my neighbor works at Cargill and he cleans out the grease straps and people throw everything down those grease straps. And he brought me home the neatest pair of stainless steel gloves. I don't believe in wearing gloves for anything on the lathe. But by golly, when I sand, I put my stainless steel gloves on. They're little links, and I haven't lost the end of a finger yet. And I used to be walking around all the time with the end of my finger gone. Ooh, that hurts. <laughs> if you had one of those, you could do this without having a drum sander? Is that what you're saying? You betcha, and I'm going to show you how to do it in a minute. <laughs> okay, my glue is dry enough. How long did I let it sit? 30 minutes? 20 minutes? So we might, I wasn't going to do it in this order, but it took so long to get this thing half centered, I think I want to go ahead and I'm going to turn the top of this now. Remember, the inside's all finished, so all I got to do now is make the top kind of match. It's a little bit, I hope. All I can do is say, say a prayer for me, please. It helps. It helps when you do what you're supposed to do. Just say a prayer. My wood turning when I do this, it makes all kinds of crazy noises, yeah. screeches, you hear screeches today, and <coughs> vibrations, and the reason is I'm doing everything backward. Usually, you know, if I use a solid piece, what do I do? I make this part the right thickness and then I move back and make this part. And I always have this extra wood back here supporting me. Gone. So my pieces screech and they do all kinds of things. I hope that doesn't make sense. Right? picture of what the inside looks like in my head and I'm hoping that I can match the outside to the inside. If I don't, we might have to make a funnel out of this. Uh, I could. There's one problem with this, it, that this center is not fitting the hole. Uh, I could probably do that. I can't do it. Yeah, I can't do it for long. And Mick, when you put this together, do you do, do you put all your base rings on at the same time and then turn it, or do you turn like one ring? Absolutely not. I turn one ring at a time. And I'm going to show you a little more about that later. Let's go ahead and bring that up, and it'll be a little, bit, a little easier. And the reason I didn't do that is because of my stupidity, stupidity, my trick that I pulled. Oh, yeah. 
You know, I am so used to that vibration and that noise. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't bother me anymore, I guess. Probably I've destroyed my eardrums is why. I was talking to Alan 
legislature. And he got to this this point, you know, he's a skew man. He got to this part with the skew and he had this little thing down here. And I said, Alan, you're a skew man. How do you get that out of there? He said, Sam Baker. <laughs> so the only thing I'm going to do on this part will be done when we take this off already and do something else when we come back. Remember, this is all finished except right here. Well, I want to finish right there. I know I'm supposed to stop the wave. Well, I will someday. And you know something else? I brought those nice glasses, and where in the hell are they? I've never put them on. They're over there. They're protecting the scissors in front. On this side. Well, a little late now. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm learning. Okay. You didn't want to find them. You could use that. I like to lose them. I actually went to the problem of, uh, or the, of cleaning them so I could see through them. <laughs> the last time I wore a face shield, I have a comb that I sometimes sharpen my skew with, and it always helps with you. On the, <laughs> on the, on the home, while I went, and I didn't get on the home, and I looked up here, and there's a big wild spit right there. <laughs> That's a catch. Which I'm probably going to have to smooth out a little.